Good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening for the next um, sermon in our series, When Fathers Hide Their Sins, They Lose Their Sons. We're going to be picking up today in 2 Samuel chapter 14. 2 Samuel chapter 14. <clears throat> I'm going to read you a little bit of an excerpt from chapter 14, but really our thoughts today is from chapter 15. And the idea is there is a deceiver in the midst there's a deceiver in the midst and what this deceiver looks like and how to identify them and um, what to do about them. I don't know if we'll get to the what to do about them today. That'll probably be some following um, messages. But uh, these are, <clears throat> the way Absalom conducts himself here is going to be very um, respectable in nature. Uh, I want to read this small portion uh, from chapter 14, the end of chapter 14, verses 25 through verse um, 28, and then um, the last verse in chapter 14 to kind of give us a little insight. Now, pick back up where we left off. David has sinned with Bathsheba. David tried to cover it up. David killed Uriah. Uh, Nathan was sent by God to confront David. Uh, David now is in a situation and a place where uh, um, he repents and he gets his heart right between God. So vertically, he gets things right, but horizontally, the consequences for his sin are about to play out. He loses the baby. Uh, he loses Amnon. Absalom has killed him. Absalom waited two years after Amnon raped his sister Tamar and then ran away to Grandma and Grandpa's house for three years. That's five years. And now we're going to read about two more years that passes, which is a total of seven years that has occurred since the whole uh, Amnon Tamar situation. So these chapters span many, many years, and it's easy to read these really fast and not understand the amount of time that's passing here that people are thinking about these thoughts and they are pondering about these things and they're kind of running their mind and running their lives. So chapter 14 and verse 25, the Bible gives us a little insight into Absalom. It says in verse 25, But in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. So Absalom was an extremely handsome man. There was nobody that was like him. Verse 26 says, And when he pulled his head, for it was ev it was at every year's end that he pulled it. Was that word pulled me? Well, basically it's uh, cutting his hair. When he pulled his head... Um, at the end of the year, because the hair was heavy on him, therefore he pulled it, he weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight. Now, my understanding, and you'll have to forgive me here if I'm, if I'm way off, but my understanding is this is somewhere around five pounds worth of hair. Somewhere around, I think there's some conservative estimates of around three pounds, but somewhere between three to five pounds worth of hair. So he lets his hair grow out all year, and at the end of the year, his head, hair is so heavy, he's struggling to hold his head up, and he ends up getting his hair cut, and it's somewhere around five pounds worth of hair. Verse 27 says, And unto Absalom there were born three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. So Absalom had three sons. We don't know their names. He had a daughter whose name was Tamar, and he named her more than likely after his sister Tamar. So he's got these three sons, and as we read and study the story of Absalom, what we'll find out is when Absalom dies, there's no, he has no sons. The Bible makes a point of saying that there was no one to keep his name, and something happened to these three boys. We, we don't know what it was that happened. It doesn't record what happened, or if it does, I haven't found it, uh, but it doesn't record what happens to these three boys and we don't have their names we just know that at some point Absalom had three sons and and they don't make it to the end of Absalom's life now he had three sons and one daughter and it says that his daughter he named Tamar in verse 27 and the Bible says that she was a woman of a fair countenance just like Tamar was a beautiful woman just like he was a handsome man his daughter Tamar was a beautiful young lady Verse 28 says, So Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. Saw not the king's face. So now we have two years that go by that no one does anything about Amnon and Tamar. Absalom finally does something about it. Then we have three years that Absalom runs off to Grandma and Grandpa's house uh, in Gesher on his mom's side. That's five years now. 
And now we have two more years after David finally brings Absalom back, after Joab gets this woman from Tekoa to go in and present this situation to kind of pull on the heartstrings of David. And David says, bring him back. But then David kind of says, you know what? At the very last moment says, I don't, I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to see you. So now two years goes by before Absalom finally is brought before David. So we have a total of seven years. And we know I don't want to get too deep into numbers and pictures and types and everything. I just can't help but see this seven years as like this completion of Absalom's bitterness, this completion of this break in this relationship. There was this completion that just was a a final thing after these two years had passed. These seven years, bitterness had finally taken root. Bitterness had finally taken control. Anger, and he had put together plots, and now he's about to try to steal the kingdom. But let's read the very last verse of chapter 14. Verse 33 says, So Joab came to the king and told him, and when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king, Absalom did, and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. There's this picture of forgiveness that's going on. We don't have the words recorded that David says, I forgive you. We don't have the words recorded that Absalom says, will you please forgive me? But culturally, there was this thing that happened that when the two parties came together and there was this kind of, you know, this, and and, and even still now, I don't know that I fully understand the cultural sign of this kiss, but it it was this type of forgiveness, this type of peace, this type of, um, okay, things haven't been right between us, but we're going to move forward and try to make them right. Now, Absalom, the very next verse, chapter 15 starts, we're going to find out that's not what Absalom's plan was. But he's getting David's hopes up that maybe there's some restoration between them. So chapter 15 and verse 1, we're going to start to see Absalom's going to play this part of a deceiver. He's going to play this part of deceiver, and there's a lot of great pictures and types and a lot of great illustrations and a lot of great principles in here. I'm going to try to keep it straightforward for us here this evening. But verse 1 says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses, and 50 men to run before him. It came to pass after what? After he finally got back to David. Seven years has gone by. He's finally gotten back to David. There was this situation where they got together in in each other's presence. David kissed him. They kind of made up. Now after that, Absalom gets these horses and these chariots and 50 men to run before him throughout the city. And Absalom, in verse 2, rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. So Absalom gets up early in the morning. He goes out, and he's basically standing kind of in the gates, waiting on people who have an issue that are going to come and present it to the king, or maybe one of the king's counselors. They're kind of bringing this issue to uh, the king's palace right there. And Absalom catches them before they get there. And he says, uh, w- what's going on here? He says, of what city art thou? And he said, thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom, verse 3, said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right. See, he's playing sides here. He's going to start playing sides. He's going to start trying to steal the hearts. He's going to start really buttering people up. Remember, he's a very handsome man. He's very powerful being the king's son. Uh, He's kind of your modern-day influencer. He has all of the influencer capabilities and abilities that social media presents to people today, except... There was no social media back then. He literally went out to the gates and met people with his good looks and his powerful position, and he's the king's son, and he's got all of these horses, and he's very impressive, and people are very impressed with him. So when they come out to have their problem solved by the king, here's the king's son, somebody extremely important who wants to solve their matters and who's on their side. And so it says in verse 3, See thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Can you hear the little subtleness that Absalom goes, Listen, the, listen, you're, you're right in this situation. Whatever the situation is, whatever tribe you're from, listen, you're right. But the king hasn't sent anybody out here to solve your problems. But I'm here. That's what he says in verse 4. Verse 4 says, Absalom said, Moreover, Oh, that I were made judge 
in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. You see, the, the idea that Absalom's portraying is, is that you're always right. What, whatever your situation is, it's right, it's good, and I'm going to find in your favor. And, and if I could, boy, if I was just the judge and I could solve these problems for you, I sure would solve them for you. And I, and I would make sure that, that you got, it's kind of like those um, uh, uh, commercials that come on TV for these accident lawyers that want to come in. You know, it's your money and you deserve it now. You know, and, and all of this idea that Aslan's putting forth, there's nothing new today. He's saying, listen, you're right. And I want to solve your problem for you. He says, if I was only made a judge... Verse 5 says, And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do obeisance, he put forth his hand, took him, and kissed him. So when anybody comes to the gate, Absalom's getting up early in the morning. Every morning he's going out to meet these people. He's really putting a show on. He's handsome. He's powerful. He's influencing. He's got this great show of horses and chariots. And he's on your side. And he's buttering you up. And every time somebody comes out, they see the king's son. And they come down to kind of bow and do obeisance to him and, and really reverence him. And Absalom catches him by the hand and says, oh, no, no, no. No reason to bow. We're friends. I'm on your side. And so he puts forth his hand and he takes the person and he kisses the person and he says, oh, we're in this together. You're not the enemy. Everybody else is the enemy. And he's really laying it on thick. Well, verse 6 says, And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. He didn't just do this for a day. He didn't just do this for a week. I don't know what the timeline is. But when you think about the word all Israel, I, I mean, this had to be going on day after day after day for a long time. And Absalom, it says at the end of verse 6, So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Well, eventually, verse 7 shows up. It says it came to pass that Absalom goes and talks to David. He's stolen the hearts of the people of Israel, and he goes and he talks to David. He's, his, his phase one of his plan is, is, in, is ready. Okay, people are on my side. Now phase two enters in. I need to create a diversion. So he goes to David. He goes to the king. He goes to his father, and he says, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. For thy servant vowed a vow while I abode in Geshur in Syria, Remember, that's when he's back at Grandma and Grandpa's house for three years. He's telling the king now, I vowed a vow while I was there, and I need to go pay it to the Lord. Uh, it's somewhere in Deuteronomy uh, that talks about if you vow a vow unto the Lord, if you make a promise to the Lord and you don't keep it, that that's sin. That's, that's a sinful thing to do. And so Absalom's putting forth here that, listen, I told God that, you know, if he would do something for me, then, then I would actually do something for him. So I need to go and pay that vow. It says in verse 8, for, I, for thy servant vowed a vow while I abode in Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. Listen to what he's saying. Don't miss this. He's saying, Dad, I really missed you when I was out at Grandma and Grandpa's house. And, and I got alone with God. See how spiritual he's making this? I got alone with God, and I told God, God, if you bring me back to Jerusalem so I could be reconciled with my dad, if you bring me back to Jerusalem where I could be reconciled with the people, your people, God, if you would just bring me back, then, then God, then I'll serve you. I'll, I'll do whatever you want, Lord. And, and now he's gone to David, and he's put forth this whole plot, and this, uh, or he's stolen the hearts of the people, and now he's putting forth this plot that, uh, that probably has, we don't know for certain that it's not true, but I feel confident to tell you this didn't really happen. He's about to steal, try to steal the kingdom. And so he goes to David and he says, listen, while I was over there in Geshur, I, I promised the Lord that if God restored me and you back together, that, you know, I just, I'd serve the Lord with all my heart, all my days, and just do whatever God wanted me to do. So let me, let me go now back to Hebron. Now, don't miss this. You, you probably are aware of this, but Hebron is a very special place in the Bible. I'm going to give you a list of things that happen in Hebron, but this is not even close to the complete list. These are just some highlights. Abram built an altar there in Genesis chapter 13. Sarah was buried there in Genesis chapter 23. Joseph was sent to his brothers from there in Genesis chapter 37. Isaac died there in Genesis chapter 35. The 12 spies came to this place, Hebron, in Numbers chapter 13. Joshua takes the land back in Joshua chapter 10 and then gave it to Caleb for inheritance in Joshua chapter 14. 
The Gazites, Hebron is the place where the Gazites tried to capture Samson in Judges chapter 16. This Hebron is where David was made king. It was actually the birthplace of Absalom, and it was again the place where David was made king over all Israel. Remember, he was made king at first just over a portion, and then eventually they moved the ark. He was made king over all of Israel. Now, that's just a handful of items that happen there. So not only is there some personal significance that Absalom is saying here when he says, let me go pay my vow, but there's also some historical significance that this place mattered. Hebron was very special to not just Absalom, but to the history of the Jews. It was a special place. So there's this cultural significance. There's this personal significance. There's this spiritual significance. I prayed this prayer when I was out there with God when we were separated that God would bring us back together. And look what God's done. Hasn't God been good? And boy, he's really putting on a show. And so the king says to him in verse 9, and the king said unto him, go in peace. And he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as ye hear the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth, reigneth, don't miss that word, reigneth, he is the king in Hebron. And when Absalom went, uh, and with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called. And they went in their simplicity and knew not anything. These 200 men that follow Absalom, they, when they went and followed him, they did not initially know what Absalom's plot and plan was. So he hadn't just fooled David. He had fooled these 200 men that were going with him. It says they went in their simplicity. They were unaware of what his true motives were. And then our last verse here, verse 12. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gileonite, David's counselor from his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong. Uh, We live in a day and age of conspiracy theories, okay? This literally, the conspiracy was strong. There was talk. There was language. Why is Absalom doing these things? Uh, The word had probably even at this point had left the palace about what Absalom had done with Amnon. People probably knew Amnon uh, was dead at this point. And and so there's word getting out and there's all kinds of different stories that are being told. And and people are, are starting to create a supposition around why the story exists. And so the conspiracy is growing. While the conspiracy is growing, Absalom's been out there winning the hearts of the people. Why? So that the conspiracy would be in his favor. So that the hearts of the people would say, well, you know, Absalom wouldn't steal the throne from his father for no reason. I mean, I know Absalom. I went out there. He was a really good guy, and he was solving my problems. And I tell you what, he he really knows how to how to make you feel special. And he really knows how to, I could just see someone getting their problem solved by Absalom going, man, he sure is wise. Man, he sure cares about the people. You talk about a politician. I mean, this guy in this passage in chapter 15 is playing politics to the ultimate. And so the conspiracy was strong. And Absalom is still in the hearts of the people, so it was strong in his favor. And notice the very last sentence here in verse number 12. And the people increased continually with Absalom. They increased continually with Absalom. Now, we're talking about these respectable sins. Uh, People, uh, when Absalom came out and got in between the people and the king, nobody really thought to themselves, well, what's he doing here? Why is he doing this? So nobody says anything. It was a respectable thing. But if it hadn't have been the king's son, somebody probably would have said, listen, I came to see the king. What are you doing here? I, I'm not going to tell you what my problems are. I'm going to go to the king. But there are, there are behaviors that should be red flags. And many of these behaviors should have been red flags. They should have, why is, this, why is the king's son out here every day? Why did the king's son say that the king did not allow for somebody else to be out here to solve my problems? There is a deceiver, and I, I want to show you five ways, probably four, but there's a fifth thing in here right in the middle of all of it, but five ways to identify this deceiver. Five ways to identify this deceiver. So let's look first of all. The very first thing I want you to see about Absalom is he stood in the gate. 
Notice, notice where he's standing, and, and my head's kind of in the way of some of these words here, so you have to forgive me for that. But first of all, he stood in the gate. In, in verse 2 it says, Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man had a controversy came, uh, uh, when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, that Absalom called unto him and said, uh, "What city art thou?" So Absalom's standing over here by the gate, in the gate, somewhere around the gate, and he sees somebody coming, and they got an issue, and he calls out to him, "Hey, over here! Where are you from, buddy? Well, what are you doing here?" And so he calls him over. And Absalom being the king and having these horses and chariots and being impressive in all of his power and being impressive in how good he looked and all of these things, now he's, these people are interested. Can I tell you one of the red flags, one of the things that should be a red flag to you is when somebody tries to stand between you and a God-ordained authority. If, if somebody were to come to my kids and say, uh, you don't have to listen to your dad, or you don't have to go tell your dad, you can tell me. Or you don't have to listen to your mom, or you don't have to tell your mom, you can tell me. I would go to that person and I would tell them to mind their own business. I would tell them not to tell my children to not go to the proper authority that God had set up in their parents. Can I tell you the same is true when it comes to church? There are people who are wolves. Sometimes the wolf is a church member. Sometimes a wolf is a church leader. But there are people who are wolves that their desire is to keep you between you and your pastor, or even worse, to keep you from being uh, from from you and God. They want to get in between, and they want to use their logic, and they want to use their mind, and they want to use their experience, and they want to use their expertise to solve all your problems. They don't want you to pray about it. They don't want you to talk to God. They don't want you to talk to your parents. They don't want you to talk to your pastor. They don't want you to talk to the proper authorities. I mean, you can see this play out even with the police, where a criminal tries to cover up what they're doing. They want to avoid going through the proper modes of authority. Absalom is cutting people off from the king. And you better watch it when people start trying to cut you off when they start trying to get your attention, this ought to be a red flag in your mind. He's very deceptive. He's very good looking. He, he's all on your side. And yet these people are completely oblivious to what it is he's trying to accomplish. He's trying to steal the, the kingdom from his father. Seven years has gone by and Absalom is bitter and he's frustrated and he's angry and he's hateful and he has a plan. If my dad won't be the king that he's supposed to be, well, then I'll just go ahead and be that king. I'll go ahead and take over. And the plan started. Red flag number one, when somebody stands between you and your pastor, when somebody stands between you and your parents, when somebody stands between you and God, red flag. Now, I'm not telling you every time somebody does this that it's bad or it's wrong, okay? I'm saying red flag. Things ought to be going off in your mind. Why did they tell me not to go talk to my pastor? Why did they tell me not to talk to my parents? Why did they tell me? These are lessons we should teach our children. You, listen, somebody comes to you and tells you not to talk to your parents. You tell them, yeah, nice try, small fry. I'm going to talk to my mom and dad and tell them what you just said. These are things we should tell our children. If somebody's trying to get between our children and us, that's, that's a devilish thing that's happening. And I think the greater, bigger picture we'll see unfold here is this is a great picture of what Satan tries to do in our Christian lives. He tries to stand between us and God and keep us from having the right relationship with God. Now again, don't miss this. Is Absalom wrong? Yes, he's wrong. This situation is occurring because of choices that David made a few chapters before. The choice he made with Bathsheba that strapped him in his conscience from dealing with Amnon, from dealing with Absalom, from uh, allowing a relationship to be healed between him and Absalom for two more years. These things, he was strapped in his conscience and he was kept from doing these things because he thought to himself, he more than likely thought to himself, the Bible doesn't record what I'm about to say. It's more of me reading into what I'm reading here in the entire picture of the story. 
But he was probably strapped by his bad example and thought, how am I going to tell somebody else not to do something? Or how am I going to deal with somebody on a legal matter when God didn't deal with me the same way? Absalom stood. You see, we don't think that our sins are going to cause our children to come back and hate us. We don't think that our sins are going to cause our children to come back and have a problem between us and our children. But that's exactly what's happened here. Absalom stood in the gate. Secondly, Absalom solved their lawsuits. I could say Absalom solved their problems. Verse 4 says, Absalom said, Moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me. Because I would do him justice. I would do him right. I, I would treat him right. I would take care of it. In verse 3, it's not here on our screen, but verse 3 he says, Hey, listen, I... The king doesn't have anybody out here for you. But man, if I could do it, if somebody would just give me the right, I would solve your problem. I would do you justice. It better be a red flag when someone goes, hey, I can solve your problem. Don't worry about the word of God. Don't worry about the king of kings. Don't worry about the authority that God has set up in your pastor or your parents or whatever it is. I am going to stand between you and where God set up the proper authorities. Not only that, but I'm going to come to you and I'm going to solve your problems. You don't even have to worry about going to your parents or your, or your pastor or your God. You don't have to worry about any of that. I'll solve all your problems for you. Red flags. Red flags should be going off. They're standing between me and God. They're standing between me and my pastor. They're standing between me and my parents. They're standing between me and my spouse. They're standing between me and my job. And now, not only are they standing between us, that's red flag number one, now... They've gotten themselves involved in my business that wasn't any business of theirs. I didn't seek out Absalom. Absalom was seeking them out. Absalom was standing in the gate waiting for them to show up. So I didn't come to this guy. He came to me. And now he's telling me he can solve my problems. And he's got a whole plan that he's on my side and that I'm always right and that he's going to do me justice. Red flag number two should be going off. Red flag number two should be just boop, 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 going off. Absalom stood in the gate. Absalom tried to solve their problems. Notice thirdly, he stole their hearts. Verse 6, And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. I have visited with a couple of pastors before who had situations where there was somebody, a family, a man, or whatever in their church who um, had that wolf spirit that was trying to get between the people and the pastor, that was trying to get between the people and their God, that was trying to get between marriages and trying to get, can I tell you something? Red flag number three. Red flag number three. Not only is Absalom standing in the way, not only is Absalom trying to solve their problems, but now Absalom is stealing the hearts of the people. He's turning their affections away from the king and to himself. That's that whole idea of influencer, popularity. What do I have to do to get more followers? What do I have to do to get more likes? Where do I have to go? What do I have to do? What do I have to say? I'll do whatever it takes to steal their hearts and get them to pay attention to me. Don't worry about the king. Don't worry about the king of kings. Don't worry about the authorities that he set up, the judges that he set up, the under shepherds, if you'll give me the liberty to use that word, and our pastors. Don't worry about the parents of the home. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Let me solve all your problems. I'll stand in the way between you and whatever you're trying to go and wherever you're trying to get to. I'll solve your problems and I'll become all of your affection and the apple of your eye and I'll solve all your problems and I will mean the world to you and I'll steal your heart. Now, he's not going to say it that way, but that's what happens. Red flag number one, stand in between me and the proper authority. God himself, my pastor, my parents, my spouse, my, my employer, somebody is stand, uh, the, the proper uh, authorities in the police, somebody is standing between me and the proper authorities that God had set up. Red flag number two, they're trying to solve my problems. I didn't even come to them. I didn't ask them for advice. They offered it. Red flag number three. They're making it all about them. Look at me. Pay attention to me. The hearts. Absalom was stealing the hearts. Stealing the hearts. 
the fourth one, this is the one I told you when we started that um, maybe, maybe it's not so much um, a, a red flag sign, but it is something that happens. Absalom sent spies. It's not always the case, but sometimes there's people that have almost kind of like a, uh, when you talk about wolves, they, they run in packs. So Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel saying, as soon as you hear the, trump, uh, the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say Absalom reigneth in Hebrew. So he sends these spies out to, to do his bidding, to do his business, not the king's business, not the pastor's business, not God's business, not the marriage business, but his business. You see, all of this is about him. And when you start seeing people, this is, this is what I would call red flag number four, although this is one that probably doesn't always happen. But it is something you should look for and pay attention to. If there's somebody that has a whole group of followers that follow them, they're not following God, they're not following the Word of God. They're not following the Spirit of God. They're following a man. You kind of get into this mindset of what we see today in more of a cultish aspect. That's what's happening here. These spies are loyal to Absalom, and they're, they're taking his message to all the tribes of Israel. Go around and tell everybody about what we're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to do and tell them when they hear the sound of the trumpet what it means so that they'll tell everybody else, I guess that's it. I guess Absalom accomplished what he was trying to accomplish. Red flag number one, somebody standing between you and God. Red flag number two, that person is trying to solve your problems and you did not seek them out. They sought you out. Red flag number three, they're trying to get you to pay attention to them so that they can steal your heart and make your heart focus on them. Red flag number four. They got a group of people who are all about them. Not about God, not about God's word, not about what's right and good, but about them. Lastly, red flag number five. Notice Absalom strengthened himself. Verse 12 says, And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gileonite, David's counselor from his city, even from Gila, while he offered sacrifices. So Absalom's got these spies that are going out in all the tribes, and he sends somebody. He says, Go get Ahithophel. This is, this is David's counselor. This is going to kind of be the final straw, because when verse 13 shows up in our next lesson, you're going to see that once they come and tell David, Hey, listen, your right-hand man in Ahithophel, he's... He's, he's with Absalom now. David's going to go, it's time to get. It's time to get out of Dodge. It's time to get out of, out of Jerusalem. It's time to go ahead. Absalom's got everything he wanted. He's got all the power. So Absalom kind of goes for this last, this final straw that's going to break everything. He sends for Ahithophel, David's counselor from a city, while he's offering sacrifices. And the Bible says, and the conspiracy was strong. Remember, um, one of the things we talked about and we're going to see eventually, but we've just kind of talked about it, is Ahithophel was related to Bathsheba. This is her, this is her grandfather. So Ahithophel, we're going to find out, has a ton of pent-up anger and bitterness towards David, just like Absalom. And these two guys are going to get together, and they're going to be the end of each other, is really what's going to happen. But they're just going to work each other up. Uh, this is what bitterness does. It finds other people who are bitter. This is what anger does. It finds other people who are angry. And, and it just you end up destroying each other. You destroy yourself, but you end up helping each other destroy yourself. He strengthened himself. Now, he thought he was strengthening himself. Really, what he's going to do is destroy himself. But this is, this is red flag number five. When somebody is all about posturing and position, and posterity. It's all about them. It's all about putting them in a good light. And they get their feelings hurt when someone doesn't recognize them. Red flag. Now, all I've shown you here this evening is these red flags. There's a deceiver in the midst. How does this translate today? Okay, I'm going to tell you how it translates to today. I've shown you the five ways to identify a deceiver. 
Number four about the spies, that's not always the case, although I have seen it before, but it's not always the case. But these other four, and I would even say all five, but these other four are pretty much dead on always the case. If you see all four of these, all of the red flags working together should say something's going on here. To not be blinded, to not have blinders on and go, oh, it's okay, he loves the Lord and nothing's really going. Remember Absalom, he goes to David and he goes, hey, I bowed a bow to the Lord. I made a promise to God that if he restored us, he, I mean, people will spiritualize anything and they will make, them sound, make themselves sound extremely spiritual, extremely important, extremely powerful. Why? Ulterior motives. And the motive in our next lesson is going to be shown. Now, how do these red flags transition to today? Well, you can mark it down. These principles are shown in, in the devil himself. One, the devil wants to stand between families. He wants to break up the home. He wants to destroy families. He wants to destroy churches. He wants to destroy the relationship that we have with God. He wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy our country and our nation. Uh, think about how divided we are as a nation right now. I don't know. I keep hearing people say we've never been this divided before as a nation. I don't know if that's a feeling or if that's a fact, but it sure feels that way to me too. But the devil wants to stand between families, wants to stand between church families, wants to stand between the family of God, wants to stand between families and their home, wants to see families broken and, and battered and bruised. The devil wants to stand between families. Can I tell you, secondly, the devil wants to solve your problems. He wants to solve your problems. Why does the Bible say that he can make himself appear as an angel of light? I'll tell you why. Because he wants to make it look like he's the good guy. This is what Absalom's doing. Absalom's trying to make himself appear as the good guy. He's saying, listen, if I was the judge, your matter is good and right. And if I was the judge, I would come out here and I would solve your problem and I would make it right for you. The devil wants to stand between families and he wants to solve your problems. He wants you to believe that your problems can be solved outside of church. He wants you to believe your problems can be solved outside the Word of God. He wants you to believe your problems can be solved outside of your pastor. He wants you to believe your problems can be solved outside of your parents, outside of the home. That you can go wherever it is you need to go and do whatever it is you need to do outside of the things of God and get your problems solved. And there may be, I will just tell you, there may be a temporary solution. Uh, the Bible talks about how money answereth all things. I mean, if, if you're wealthy enough and rich enough, you could probably solve a lot of your problems. You can't solve the problem of your soul with money, and you definitely can't solve the uh, relational problems, inter interpersonal relational problems between your immediate family with money, not the long-term type of problems. But there are some things you can solve if you've got enough money in the bank to just write a check that maybe it relieves certain stressors in your life not having to worry about how we're going to replace a transmission in a car or how we're going to make the rent or those are stressors in life that can cause problems in the home and maybe the devil will tell you well you know you just go find you a job somewhere else i'll pay you more money and leave your good church you can find some church somebody else somewhere else don't worry about it don't talk to your pastor about this don't pray about it don't read the bible and see if god has anything to say about it just solve it yourself you're smart enough you're wise enough you've got all the tools you need just trust your own heart the devil stands between families. The devil wants to solve your problems. The devil wants to steal hearts. When we talk about the home and the family, and, and I think about what Pastor Stanley has preached on for 30 plus years now on the home and the family, and, and one of the reasons why our families are so strong is the principles that he has preached on that come from the Word of God. They don't come from his brain. I, it, he doesn't just make this stuff up. He gets up there and he reads the principles of the Word of God and he takes the time to explain words and define terms and help us to understand what God's direction for a family and a home is. Why? Because God's Word changes people. Hebrews 4.12 Because God Himself changes people. Because our hope is in Christ. It's not in anything else or any, any other place. The local church established by Christ Himself. I didn't start a church. I mean, I get what we talk about when we say we started a church, but I didn't start this. Jesus started this. God started this. In the beginning, God, he created this whole universe. Everything was created by him, and there's nothing that wasn't created by him. But the devil wants to steal our hearts and explain away everything that the Word of God tells us. He wants us, our hearts to be stolen by entertainment. 
He wants our hearts to be stolen by someone who pays attention to us. Think about the homes that are broken and the young girls who grow up without a father and how they give themselves to the first man that comes along because they've never had a good relationship with a man before because their fathers weren't home or maybe their fathers were home, but their fathers were disengaged. They just weren't there mentally or emotionally. They were there physically, but they weren't there mentally or emotionally for that, for that young girl. Sons not knowing how to behave themselves as a man because all they've ever seen in their father is an angry person. And so they grow up and they repeat this cyclical pattern. The devil wants to steal hearts. Can I tell you, fourthly, when we think about the spies, the devil's searching for an opening. We talk about the devil, but the truth is the Bible tells us it wasn't just the devil that fell from heaven. There was a whole, a whole host of angels that turned into demons that went with them. And so he has his own spy system. There, we war not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. There, there is a whole spy system that the devil has that maybe he can't read our thoughts, but he's watching our behaviors. And, and, and God forbid I even use this kind of thought, but taking notes, knowing what we're susceptible to so that they can have a plan of attack to ruin our lives. The devil's searching for an opening, and it's not just him, but it's a whole legion of of demons that have followed him. He's got his own army with him attacking God's people and the whole world. Lastly, when we think about this strengthening himself, we see the devil trying constantly to form a stronghold in people's lives. This is what he's after. This is what demons are after. It's what we recently looked at uh, when we were talking about the maniac of Gadara. There was this stronghold that this legion demons had in these demoniacs' lives. Uh, we, uh, where Jesus talks about if, we don't, if, if a demon is cast out and we don't put light in, if we don't put God in, if we don't put good things in, the demon goes and gets more people and comes back and they create a bigger party within us. The devil is trying to create a stronghold in our lives, trying to enable us, trying, mm, enable is not the right word, trying to tempt us to sin so that there is a demonic opening into our lives that we struggle to fight back. We get involved in sin and we think to ourselves, why am I like this and why am I doing this and why, why am I thinking those thoughts? Now, if we think about this, so we've talked about the five, identifying these five red flags. These five things help us identify deceivers. Then we talked about how the devil really is the epitome of these five things. Now what I want you to see is David, this, this to me is the powerful part. David is in this situation because of choices he made. David is in this situation because he chose to not go out to battle, to look out on his rooftop, to see some woman taking a bath or a shower or whatever, bathing herself, to call for her to come to him, to listen to somebody say, David, this is not your wife, for him to overrule it and say, I don't care what you say, I'm going to have my way with her, for her to report back she's pregnant, for him to begin a con his own conspiracy and cover up and that ends up in killing Uriah, losing respect the respect of Joab, losing the respect of his sons, Amnon and Absalom. And now Absalom has stolen, I'm, no doubt he's lost the respect of Ahithophel, but now Absalom has not just stolen the hearts of the people, but he has stolen the heart of Ahithophel. Don't miss this. These are repercussions and consequences of David's actions. When fathers hide their sins, they lose their sons. And David never thought for a single moment that an afternoon of, of sexual pleasure on a rooftop was going to turn into all of this. And that is the lie the devil sells you. It's not that bad. It's not that big a deal. This is not as big a deal as my pastor makes it out to be. This is not as big a deal as the Bible makes it out to be. This is not as big a deal as God makes it out to be. It's okay. And it's a lie. And we've bought it hook, line, and sinker. And our families, our marriages are falling apart. 
Our children are walking away, not just from God, but in this situation here, Absalom has walked away from his relationship with his father. So our marriages are broken, our homes are broken, and because marriage and the home is what the church is built upon, our churches are broken. And because our community is built upon the churches, the Bible-believing, uh, Bible-gospel-preaching churches, our communities are broken. And we want to sit around and complain and whine about everybody who has different sinful lifestyles and opinions than what the Word of God does. And we want to blame everybody else. But the problem starts with us in our hearts, in our homes. It starts with us. Absalom. What's going on? In his heart, he's just thinking to himself, why did Dad do this? Why, why did Dad let it get to this point? Why didn't Dad do something about Amnon? Why didn't Dad, why did Dad have to do that whole deal with Bathsheba? And why did Dad have to do that whole deal with, with Uriah? And why did Dad have to, why did Dad, why did Dad, why did Dad? Respectable sins. It's not that big a deal. Oh, folks, I'm telling you. Every sin was a big enough deal to hang our Savior on a cross. He forgave every last one of them. There are no respectable sins. This is an oxymoron. Uh, I'm a regular moron, but this is an oxymoron. There, there are no respectable sins. All sin, every sin. Not just the sins that we commit, but the sin nature that we've inherited from our parents and them from their parents and them from their parents that's passed down to us all the way from Adam. That sin nature he hung on that cross for. So that for whatever reason, God could look at us and all the sin of the world would be placed upon Jesus on that cross. And for all those who would believe, would have the righteousness of God imputed, just applied because they came to the foot of the cross and believed that Jesus shed his blood for their sin, was buried, and three days later opened his eyes in the middle of that tomb where the stone was rolled back and sat up straight and looked at sin and death and said, Nice try, small fry, but I think I just whipped your tail. And then went out and showed himself for many days to over 500 people and then goes out and stands up on the hillside and just begins to levitate and just kind of whoop, gives it, and they're all standing there looking at him. And the angels go, what are you doing standing here? He's going to come back just like this. And I can't wait till he does. I always think about that verse that said, there's a crown for those that love his appearing and I'm going to love it. I'm looking forward to it. But while I'm here, apart from the grace of God, apart from me yielding my members making an active choice on a daily, if not hourly and momently basis to yield my members and to bring every thought and imagination into the captivity of Christ, I will find myself doing nothing but destroying everything God's given me. Folks, this is not about being smart enough or wise enough. David did not have what we have in the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Absalom did not have what we have in the Holy Spirit living inside of us. They didn't even have the completed Word of God that we have. They didn't have all of the computer tools to search and learn and study and understand the Word of God at the rapid speed that we have today that many of us neglect. They didn't have any of this. What God has given us is far more above and beyond anything that they had. And our accountability must be higher. Do not find yourself in a place where you think this is not a big deal. It's not a big deal. There's a deceiver in the midst. There's a deceiver in the midst. And he's trying to convince you of that. And eventually when he gets you convinced of it, you may find out you're Absalom. And now there just wasn't a deceiver deceiving you. But you are that deceiver. Well, I hope this has been a blessing to you and a help. Um, I did not take this last slide. I should have done that. But we do have a new website. It has been uh, deployed. It's buildinggodlygenerations.org, um, I believe it is. Um, you can go there and find uh, these sermons uh, on there if you're watching this on YouTube or on Facebook. 
Uh, if you have any questions or any thoughts, uh, you can see me at church. There's the church's phone number, uh, my email address, um, anything that didn't make sense or anything you want to add or rebukes or anything like that. Um, I, I try to be open to any of that. So anyways, Lord bless you. I hope this has been a help to you. We will be back next week with um, our next message. God bless you. Have a good night.